Our speaker, our president this evening, is uh, author of quite a few books. He is the archivist of special collections at Lake Forest College and Star Channel 17. <laughs> Everyone who's here for the baby shower, that's downstairs. <laughs> yeah. um, the, this map is here for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, I'm going to use it later in the program. Two, this is supposed to work. Hello, one, two, three. There we go. And it wouldn't have reached over there. The fire actually is, this is a very green afternoon, the fire doesn't uh, work. Uh, so we're not wasting any energy coming out of the, the fireplace. Um, this, this idea grew out of a, um, uh, of a retreat that the, the board of directors of the foundation held in, um, in the early fall this last year. Um, and at the beginning of that, I tried to give a little kind of introductory thing about um, sort of why Lake Forest, why it's important, why it's significant, how it actually works, how it's laid out, um, and why some of the things in it seem to be as important um, and getting, causing as much interest as they do. Um, and so I'm going to talk about this from a contextual point of view. Um, a lot of you are familiar with the basics of Lake Forest history. One of the dates that you may not have internalized is Pauline Moore here, she was giggling about uh, this date, is maybe not a household word, but that um, the Lake Forest, the original Lake Forest street plan was um, registered in the recorder's office up in Waukegan on July 31st, 1857. So last year was the 150th anniversary also of that street plan, which was um, the first of its type, and I, I'll make my first reference to the map, which I'll have to turn a little bit here and there. Um, the green part of the map is pretty much the original street plan. Um, it was laid out, it was registered in 1857. It was laid out be between October and um, probably the middle of March. Uh, October of 1856 and the middle of March in 1857. We know that because we have the minutes of the Lake Forest Association and the Lake Forest Association uh, met in Chicago um, and they were charged with coming up with how we were going to do everything here. Um, somewhere there, uh, they, were, they must have been pretty sophisticated. They, what we know about those trustees of that group were that they came from out east and they had a good deal of sophistication in the houses that they lived in, the communities they lived in, most of which were rural and um, in, in, in rocky or hilly areas. And that was true for the Scots as well, who came from um, rural and kind of up and down uh, irregular terrain areas. So um, when they decided to do this, they were, they were making a kind of an idea they didn't want it to be like uh, Chicago. This was going to be anti-Chicago. Uh, the whole plan was. The, uh, fortunately, the railroad had gone in and um, opened up to all the way to Waukegan from Chicago in January of 1855. And that's when uh, some Chicago Presbyterians, who were an alliance of the two cl most clanny uh, people that you could, clan-like people you could think of, one was the New Englanders who'd come to the Chicago area in um, just a 20-year period from 1620 to 1640, and then they intermarried for 200 years, and then they broke out and went west. Uh, and the other clannish group were the Scots. And of course, we know the Scots were the ultimate holdouts. Um, they had pulled all the way, they kind of did a rear guard action fight all the way across Europe, the Celts and things, up into the hills of Scotland. The Romans gave up. They built a wall. Um, uh, different English kings tried to take over, but they ran into Mel Gibson and different people who <laughs> kept them from being successful. And um, so the Scots were, were longtime experts at living by themselves and keeping other people at a distance. Um, they wanted to do that when they got to Chicago. Chicago 
was uh, starting out to be very small when some of them came in the 30s and 40s, less than 10,000 people by 1830, uh, by, by 1840. Um, by 1850, uh, there were getting toward 30,000 people, which by New England standards and even Scotland standards was pretty big. Um, and they got ner started to get nervous. Um, the the uh, Methodists we know, who were also uh, English-oriented, um, New England often um, people, they'd, they'd gone to Evanston, uh, the Methodists, in 1851 when the train got that far. Now the Presbyterians that came up here were more thrifty. Um, they waited to see what the developers bought and then they came in and bought what was left. Um, nobody wanted to build and the farmers hadn't even wanted to farm in Lake Forest. Uh, between the north of Lake Forest and the south of Lake Forest there are ten different ravines that cut across the bluff and the railroad people were pretty smart though. They built the railroad far enough west that it would be able to um, to be there without having to build um, expensive bridges. Uh, bridges would have wrecked the whole economic business plan, you know, if they had to build a bunch of bridges. Now the Presbyterians bought this land. It was all surplus land, pretty much owned by farmers who were a little bit farther west, over the other side of Green Bay Road. They kept it for wood lots so they could build their log homes. Um, and they um, were pretty consistent about um, keeping it and using it for firewood and things, but they didn't really develop it. There were a few homes in East Lake Forest, but not too much. Most of the farmers were pretty logical. They thought it would be easier to farm where there were no trees than where there were trees. Um, we can understand that. Good investment decision. Um, so they tended to be along Green Bay Road or west over by Waukegan Road up and down. The first ones that hit the Waukegan Road area in the 1830s um, and that was not really considered Lake Forest until later. The Lake Forest part was this green part that took place, took shape initially with this Mr. Hotchkiss, Almer and Hotchkiss, who uh, came in from St. Louis. They had to go quite a ways to find somebody up to the size of a project they were envisioning. There were a few landscape gardeners starting to gather in Chicago but they didn't yet maybe have uh, much expertise at that level. Um, the biggest place was uh, Stephen Douglas's Oakenwald Estate south of the Loop down about 30th Street. Um, and that was a pretty good sized park, uh, but it wasn't on the scale that they wanted Lake Forest to be, which would be 12 or 1300, well they were thinking maybe 2,000 acres. Um, and they bought 2,000 acres on both sides of the tracks. Uh, and, they, and they brought in Hotchkiss. Now Hotchkiss had been working in cemeteries. Cemeteries um, uh, since the, eight, at least going back into the early 1840s uh, at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York, um, overlook, kind of overlooking toward the ocean. And um, then uh, he'd moved west when someone had invited him to go to St. Louis. They had a big cholera epidemic and so he went to St. Louis to um, build a cemetery for them that they, they needed very quickly. Um, he then um, was kind of getting a little franchise there and they contacted him in Rock Island, Illinois, from Rock Island to come up and build the Chipionic Cemetery there, um, which if any of you ever go out to the Quad Cities you could take a look at. It's on a hillside, um, it has a wonderful entrance area, and then there are winding hills around the bluff and it goes up and then you look out over an open area. Very nice over kind of a river, uh, river bank system. Um, very nice. Um, and so when Hotchkiss came here, he did what he knew how to do, which was to take a cemetery plan with a, a gate and loop drives around all coming to the same place and put it onto steroids and blow it up uh, about four or five times and so that that was what Lake Forest was. So the original roads all came to the depot in Lake Forest. It was, um, his plan was to bring them all, all the roads end up, so Illinois Road, you wander along Illinois Road and it takes you up to the depot from clear off in the southeast part of town. You go on um, uh, Westminster and it branches out into Crabtree and Barbary and various things and wander, Elm Tree, I'm sorry, Elm Tree, wanders along through uh, the north part of town and then finally comes out and lets you out uh, close to the train station. So he was pretty much following his cemetery plan. Uh, it worked pretty well. Um, 
and it was a very un-Chicago-like plan. In Chicago, as early as 1844, there was a city directory. You could look up in that directory and see anybody's address, and then you could look at the map and see where they lived, and you could go visit them, whether they wanted you to or not. <laughs> so Lake Forest was the original do not call list. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, the, when you got to the train and, took, and got off of the train to see somebody, you had to know where you were going. Um, you could, all the houses were simply named by either the, they had a name like the Homestead or the Evergreens, um, or it was the somebody's place, like the Thompson place or something. Then the livery driver would take you there. Um, if, and, and the livery driver would, would make a point of, of, of making sure that you got to where you're going. But if you were there on your own and trying to walk, you would go around in circles, you would twist around, you'd turn, you'd get lost. Um, the latest time I got lost was last month um, <laughs> in Lake Forest. So it still happens to me, and I've lived here now for over 30 years. So uh, the street plan is really diabolical in the way that it winds you around. Um, there was no Sheridan Road initially. Um, Sheridan Road is really something that didn't even get conceived of until the 1890s or so. And so the, the, it rounded out, the town did, north and south. Um, north, there was a, 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 an area set aside for a cemetery, and that's where Lake Forest Cemetery is now. And Hotchkiss would have known how to do that. He gave it a very nice location right on the lake. Uh, south, it, it went out kind of at Wesley Road. It rounded out down there. Um, and so it really just was this sort of enclosed, almost gated community, and certainly uh, a don't call list if there ever was one. That was the concept. It was anti-modern. It was anti-industrial or uh, the kind of repetition of manufacturing where you'd have these blocks on blocks with streets which might start out with a street that sounded out with an A or a B and C, D, E, F like the avenues do, or the, just the plain numbers going north and south in Chicago. This was the antithesis of that. Um, they wanted nothing to do with that. They moved their, their schools out here, and they moved their families out here. Uh, some of the early books about Chicago and, and by Lake Foresters make it clear that the Presbyterian um, young men were being uh, beaten up on by the young Irish men, um, fondly referred to as mix. Uh, the mix were smashing into the uh, more hothouse brought up um, New England descendant and Scottish descendant kids. And so they ended up, um, their, their schools they're there, they had to kind of run to school. There's a great novel about this by um, Frederica Shumway Smith for children um, that she wrote, uh, lived in Lake Forest. I think the novel's from the 60s. Um, and uh, Ernest Poole also wrote a memoir to that effect. Um, he was an author, uh, novelist and author who lived in, grew up in Lake Forest at the Abram Pool Estate, now where the Kersey Coates Reed House is, and he wrote about that same phenomenon. So um, the other thing was that there were lots of temptations in Chicago. Uh, we won't go into great detail about those, um, but suffice it to say that the Presbyterians thought that their young people would be better off, and these are of course before there were internet, was any internet, better off up in Lake Forest all by themselves. Um, so the campuses were the center of town. Um, it was, this was the first curve linear street plan development to have um, a, an actual town center. There had been some subdivisions built in um, around Cincinnati uh, and outside of New York City, uh, Llewellyn Park. But this was the first one to really have a town center and a whole organization. The town center was not businesses. The businesses were all west of the town. Hence the name Western Avenue. Western Avenue was the outside the town, it was across the tracks, and that's where all the businesses could line up. And, um, and people's uh, service staffs would go there and uh, build. Now the lots were large lots. They were three, four, five acres or something like that. There were about 300 of them all together. Um, the money was raised originally by selling shares, and then the shares later were converted into lots. Um, the, the half of the lots went to fund the schools uh, to create capital that would build those. Um, there were some other things that they did, but 1857 um, turned out to be kind of a bad year. Um, they had a, they had a, a panic. Um, we don't have those anymore, fortunately. 
Um, no one ever gets excited about the economy anymore. But in those days, they used to really worry about when the economy might be heading down. Um, so people made pledges to give money and get things going, but they couldn't fulfill their pledges. So it was basically that land that got started. Um, they started developing the town very quickly. Deerpath, um, which has been called various things since then at various times, Deerpath Avenue, Deerpath Road, whichever sounded a little bit more shishi. Um, but it was basically deer path, and it was the way down to the lake that you could ride a buckboard down in 1857 uh, or 1858. You could ride it all the way from the station to the lake on a buckboard. Um, and so it was the main street. Naturally, a lot of the houses, the school, the first school building um, on, uh, for Lake Forest Academy on the, what's now North Campus of Lake Forest College, that took place along that street. There was an old hotel built in 1858 on what's now Triangle Park. Um, so then they thought, uh oh, but we have other streets too. And actually some of the people who bought the lots began to share their concerns with the Lake Forest Association. Why can't we get to our property? They'd say. Um, so the, the, meeting, the minutes of the meetings become rather animated as people are expressing their concerns about not being able to reach their property. They want more bridges. They want the stumps out of the streets. Um, they want things cleared up fast. Uh, it took a while. And they would actually call off school some days and have the students at Lake Forest Academy go out and help dig out the stumps. Um, so the, their business plan a little bit fell apart because it cost so much to get that out. But they got creative. They would bought more land than Hotchkiss wanted to deal with. So the land west of the tracks, a lot of it they gave to one of the chief stump pullers who was um, named James Anderson. He was a Scot and he was uh, pretty smart. He said, okay, give me a farm just across the tracks and I'll dig the stumps out. So the Anderson Trust, I think until fairly recent years, owned the property from Market Square down to, oh, um, around somewhere near uh, CVS or something like that. And they had a big farmhouse there and everything. And over the years, that turned out to be a fairly decent investment. Wouldn't you agree, um, <laughs> Paul, that that turned out to be fairly fruitful? Um, and I think that members of the family still are happy to receive checks on a regular basis relating to it. So that's great. Um, so he was a pretty smart Scot. Um, and so the, the west part of town began to develop slowly. Now, this was the town with the college that developed starting in 1876. College developed in the middle here. And that was the center of town, the college from 1876 until around the, the turn of the century. The Presbyterian Church built a new building in 1886. And, they, and then the, in 1892, there was a building built facing it, the Durand Institute, which was kind of a town gown, um, really art center. Uh, it was an art institute. And so those, that was really the cultural center of the town. And the people who lived in the big houses on the three to five acre lots, they didn't actually go over to Westlake Forest to the, across Western Avenue. They sent members of their staff to shop. So they didn't pay too much attention to it. Or they brought things up from down um, in the city. Um, but they mostly had, most of the big lots were all uh, people who had um, large estates and had Chicago related businesses or were listed as, and this used to be fashionable before November of 1917, they called them capitalists. Um, after the Russian Revolution, the term kind of went out as a way to call yourself. Um, they, they would now be considered investors, but they bought and sold things and they made money um, and, and bought, built great houses in Lake Forest. Lots of people lived with them and worked on their places. And this was the, 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 the character of the community. The, the children at the schools, their parents gradually building estates around it, and like-minded um, people of that sort. In the six, 1860s, especially after the Civil War, there was building, 1870s, 1880s. Um, by the 90s, things started to change. Uh, and in 1919, in a book called Chicago Yesterdays, um, one of the daughters of that first group, Grace Farwell McGann, referred to the starting of the Inuensia Club as the end of old, exclusive Lake Forest. Um, the Inuensia Club doomed that earlier phase of exclusivity and quiet, uh, hidden kind of life in here, and it changed it. Well, how did it do that? Um, earlier, the um, uh, architect, uh, Henry Ives Cobb, had built a f bought an old farm on Green Bay south of um, 
the business district, sort of, southwest of the business district, bought this farm and started to build the biggest house in town. He was a pretty busy architect, so he didn't have time to really finish it very quickly. It took from 1890 to 1893. But I think, as an architect, he sort of figured that maybe someone else will want this house. And by the, the winter of 1895, the Inwensia Club was organized out of the old Lake Forest Golf Club that had been organized a little before that in 1894, um, and that was going to be their new clubhouse. Uh, so that, that became a golf club. Golf hit Lake Forest in 1892. Uh, the first golf course was on Forest Park overlooking the lake and at, also at um, uh, the estate Fairlawn, which is, was the, the Farwell estate on the south side of Deer Path. They had seven holes. Um, they, they used tomato cans for the holes, um, and they played golf uh, kind of primitively, but it was just getting started in the east. Modern golf had come about because of some, they'd been playing golf for maybe hundreds of years, but it was kind of a dull game because the ball didn't go anyplace. But a guy figured out named Old Tom Morris in St. Andrews that if you wrapped the ball in the new kind of rubber kind of stuff that they were having, it would actually bounce and travel. And all of a sudden the game took off. Um, it, it became a huge sport in England, uh, and then it came over to the East Coast in the 1880s, and then came to here uh, in, the, in the early 1890s. And this is the next thing, and this is what transformed Lake Forest and, and creates the kind of community that, that has really two distinctive characters to it today. Um, and that's, that's the explanation of, of kind of the organizing principle of how our community is different. You can see there are two historic districts. Red and green. Um, that was last month, but anyway, it's still red and green. And the green is the old East Lake Forest District, historic district in Lake Forest. The red one is the Green Bay Road Historic District, which is the houses built along Green Bay Road after the Inuensia Club was founded in 1895. That, that area started to grow very quickly then. Why was this so attractive that you would have this Inuensia Club? And, and people would flock to it. Why was it a big deal? There are a few different explanations. We'll start with one basic one. I moved to Chicago in 1965 to go to the University of Chicago in the summer. Um, and one morning I woke up in the graduate student residence housing that I lived in, nice old mansion down on the south side, and um, there was an indescribable uh, je ne sais quoi wafting through. It was like more barnyards than you could ever imagine. It was the stockyards. Eight, 1965 was the last year of the Chicago stockyards on 40-something street, a little bit farther to the west and south from where I was. Um, it had started in 1865, lasted until 1965. Um, and everything from Hyde Park clear up to uh, Fullerton was subject to this unbelievable, um, indescribable essence that flowed from the stockyards, the greatest abattoir ever built in the world. Um, <coughs> as soon as the heating season ended, um, you know, maybe around April 15th or something, and people had to put the windows up, they moved to Lake Forest. Uh, they went to the suburbs, they got out of town. The every, if you follow the train tracks out, and wherever there are hills or irregular terrain along the rail tra road tracks, like Hinsdale, for instance, you'd have people going out for the, to get away from the, the smell in the summertime. Um, the, the, uh, the Howard Van Doren Shaw, the architect's daughters, always joked about this, that they had been yanked out of school April 15th and taken to the Lake Forest schools and then yanked out of the Lake Forest schools and taken down into the city to school November about first, a little after Halloween. And they had Latin American history six times and they completely missed U.S. history. Um, <laughs> so it had a very peculiar effect on, um, on, on Lake Forest development. But um, also, Lake Forest already had this sort of New England Scottish cast to it, and so the old New England elite who had come to, like, for, to Chicago first, um, technically, about 15 minutes before other groups, um, and, the, and of course the Native Americans don't count because they were quickly moved west, but the first uh, European Americans that really arrived had one characteristic that was very important. They had access to capital. 
Capital was what came from their grandfathers and their uncles and their cousins and their dad and their Aunt Susie in, up in the hills of New England or in New York State um, who they would write back and say, Aunt Susie, we can make a bundle if we can invest in real estate in Chicago. Um, and so Aunt Susie would send money. The Scots came here for very much the same reason. One fellow, and Shirley Paddock has figured this out, one fellow, a fellow named um, George Smith came to Chicago in 1833 from Aberdeen, um, wrote home and said, this is really great. We could buy a lot of land here uh, with the new money we're making um, in, the, in the Industrial Revolution over there, and we could invest it, and we could own practically the whole place. Um, so they formed an Illinois Investment Committee, and Shirley's actually gone over to Aberdeen and seen the original documents. They formed an, an, an Illinois Investment Company and um, came over and started buying land heavily. Now, again, they had a problem. They needed people that they trusted so they would get family members. So the, uh, the, the, the Scots brought over their family members. Some of these were Andersons. Um, Sylvester Lynn, they all came from a little area outside of Aberdeen, a little bit north of Aberdeen, uh, pretty close. And so that was the group of, of Scots, and they came out here to Lake Forest. Um, the, the New Englanders were very much the same way, and, and they, the, the Hubbard family was the early ones to come here, and all the cousins and uncles and aunts, and there were lots of them that moved into Lake Forest. There are lots of Hubbard houses in Lake Forest, actually, or were a long time ago Hubbard houses. Um, <coughs> starting with the big white house across from uh, Lake Forest College on Sheridan Road. That was the Holt house, but Mrs. Holt was a Hubbard, um, a, cousin, a distant cousin, and her sister, who was a distant cousin, had actually married Gurdon Hubbard, so she was Mary Hubbard Hubbard or something like that. Um, so you couldn't get much closer to the Hubbards than that. Um, and, and they were uh, early uh, entrepreneurs in Chicago. But the, the original people who came in the 1840s and 50s and that sort of thing became a very successful group as Chicago grew from 30,000 in 1850 to over a million in 1890. It had the great empire outside of all around Chicago. A uh, book's been written by William Cronin about Chicago's empire reaching out to the west coast on the railroads, south to the Gulf, Panama Limited, uh, east to the Broadway Limited in the 20th century uh, vying for um, the, the traffic to New York City in the railroad era. So basically from the 18, let's say right after the Civil War until um, the 1940s, the railroad was king. Distribution was always crucial and where could you get the best distribution? Chicago. So that had poured this money and they were the equivalent of dot-com millionaires. Uh, the early Lake Foresters, many of them at, that came after the Civil War, were, the, were these kind of railroad millionaires. Um, they came and became wealthy very quickly. For instance, the Reed family, R-E-I-D, that contributed a lot to the college, uh, the chapel in the uh, Reed Hall there. Um, they came to Chicago in 1865, uh, moved out to Lake Forest around 1869, and built a big house by 1872. So it shows that, you know, that was what was happening. They had young people in the schools. Uh, that was the magnet that drew them in. Um, so the what flushed them further out west was this Enwensia Club. It did golf, we talked about that, and the farm became the golf course. Um, but it was more than just golf, it was fox hunting. Uh, they were very into English sports. Um, they um, started fox hunting very uh, right, right off the bat in the 1890s. All kinds of equestrian sports, jumping, uh, horse shows from 1900 until 1970. Every year there were horse shows in June at Enwensia. Uh, some people probably remember those. Uh, I wasn't here yet. Um, but, but these were huge draws, and that's why we actually had a new train station built in 1900 to handle the crowds. It was the biggest suburban station. Now, it probably didn't hurt that the chairman of the railroad lived in Lake Forest with his three daughters and their two architect's sons, Frost and Granger. Um, but we had the largest suburban railroad station. Frost was really the guy who was the main, um, he created really the model for all the railroad stations in the West, big ones and little ones. Um, and when they couldn't actually hire him to be architect, they would sometimes hire him to just do a, a template that they would use, and they probably just stole from his plans anyway. Um, but he was the, the main guy for railroad stations. Um, and they built a good number of buildings in Lake Forest. Um, the train station 1900 had been preceded 
<coughs> by one building we don't know the architect of yet, the Blackler Building on the southwest corner of um, Deer Path and Western Avenue. It's three stories, the first three-story tall building. It has a little tower on it. And before long, we had a whole bunch more towers. Um, the city hall was built in 1899 um, by, um, it, with its tower. Uh, now, the, that building came, across very, came along very interestingly because um, in 1899, there had been a railroad, a, a, an interurban building north and south, north from Chicago, south from Milwaukee and Waukegan, and they were getting close to Lake Forest, and they wrote them a letter and said, okay, we're ready to build our railroad through your town now. And the city of Lake Forest wrote back and said, what railroad? Um, and so it ended up that they paid $10,000 to be able to build the railroad through Lake Forest. Guess what the price of the new city hall built in 1899 was? $10,000. <laughs> now these were Scots and New Englanders who knew how to get and save a penny. Um, that, that building uh, included the fire station, the library, um, and the city, all the city offices. The city clerk, Mr. King, uh, lived there, um, or worked there, I'm sorry. The, the library and the, and the fire station were not natural good neighbors, however, and the, after the first time that um, the, the librarian came to work in the morning and found the hoses drying, out, spread out over all the bookshelves and tables, um, I would have loved to have been there to have heard the inner office communication that day. Um, <laughs> But they soon built another building, which is now Southgate, which had the, for, the, for the fire station, station uh, fire trucks and where they could probably upstairs spread out their hoses somehow to dry. Um, and so the, why were they starting to build nice buildings in the business district? They were pretty simple buildings before. Because to get to the Alencia Club, you had to go through downtown. You had to cross the tracks, and you had to see everything. Um, and so they began to improve the community. The Brett Blackler building, the first one, is 1895. City Hall is 1899. Then there are some buildings built on north on Western Avenue from the train station across the street. Then in 1903 or 04, we have uh, the Walgreens building going up. Uh, James Gamble Rogers built it. Um, and uh, that really kind of led them to thinking about what were they going to do about downtown? By that time, there were estates all up and down Green Bay Road. Howard Van Doren Shaw had um, built some north, and Henry Ives Cobb himself had other customers who were building houses south of Deer Path. Um, and the idea was that they had great views out over the sunset. And the, it leads me to talk about how Lake Forest's form is and, and, and what, what shape it is. The, the Green Bay Road was the Continental Divide. Water that fell um, east of that, after it travels through my basement, goes into <laughs> Lake Michigan. Um, <laughs> water from the west, it goes into the system of the uh, Illinois River, the Des Plaines River, Illinois River, Chicago River, basically. It's the north branch of the Chicago River, and it flows down and eventually gets to the Gulf of Mexico. So the water from my basement goes to the St. Lawrence system and out. Um, water from um, um, somebody else's basement who lives in Westlake Forest is going to um, the, the, the Gulf of Mexico. That was how Chicago would come about in the first place, but it was certainly an important part of the, the story. The land west was a series of sandbars um, as you went. The first big sandbars were like around Sheridan Road-ish kind of, and then uh, Green Bay Road, and then further out. But mostly east side was all these ravines. The ravines were probably a combination of rapid outflow from the glaciers 13,000 years ago and also just gradual erosion over time. Those 10 deep cuts into the bluff along the, the, the town in Lake Forest. The bluffs are pretty high here. They're up to maybe 90 feet in some places. Um, so th it's the beginning of the kind of Wisconsin system of more rolling country, uh, breaking with the Chicago system of flat uh, or swamp, we could say. Um, at least that's what my great-great-great-grandfather uh, called it, he called Chicago a swamp when he came here in 1856 and said it would never go, it was never going to be successful, and founded Leland, Michigan instead as the great metropolis of the West. Um, <laughs> great business insight. <coughs> but um, it was, you know, the buildings were still down in the mud at that point. So, um, but as you came up this way, the land was more rolling.
uh, as you go west, you have these sloughs in between the, uh, the sandbars, and those flow down. There's the east branch, the middle fork, the west branch, and then the Des Plaines River. <coughs> and in between are these sandbars. The big country places of the Lake Forest and Wensia members are on those sandbars. And you can just kind of follow them along. They'll be in rows along an, uh, on Awani Road and Ridge. That's kind of one sandbar system along Awani Road and Ridge, looking west mostly. Um, then you go to Waukegan Road, and they're all looking out west again. Um, where F Route 41 was was kind of a crick. It was one of the low areas in between. Um, hence, it's floods when we have a lot of rain. Um, so it was kind of a really interesting way that the geography of the community developed. But they were fox hunting out across these areas. And some of the farmers were not totally crazy about this whole idea of fox hunting, especially when they had crops to bring in. So they quickly were making arrangements with the people to build their estates on their property, and they were selling off their farms and moving uh, into town. Uh, the most notable one, the most famous one, is Mr. Melody, who sold to John, J. Ogden Armour in 1904. Um, and uh, his, uh, he was given a house that belonged to the Armors to live in on Vine Avenue, and he lived there. Uh, so that was, that was their ideal for the farmers, is to get rich and move to town. Um, after working a whole career, they could retire. Um, so uh, quite a few people sold out. <coughs> Many of the farmers improved their houses after they'd sold their East Lake forest land. So it was um, definitely <coughs> becoming a, um, an area filled in with these larger estates. Now what did that do uh, when you run into other kinds of things? We've got geography, we have history, we have economics, um, we have educational history. We talked about education. Um, the college that developed. Economics was an important thing. In 1865, the United States government had, dis had ruled, the, the courts had ruled that the nasty income tax was against the Constitution and it was illegal. And so there was no income tax from 1960, 1865 until into early in the 20th century. Um, by a combination of errors, and it's a long story and actually Lake Forest plays a part in it, um, Woodrow Wilson ran for governor of New Jersey in 1910, then ran for president on the Democratic ticket, um, you know, pointy-headed professor from Princeton, and um, nobody expected him to win except the Republicans did something that only they could do. They uh, actually split their vote between Theodore Roosevelt, the previous president, and the current president, William Howard Taft. Um, the result was that probably no one's surprised more than Wilson, he was President of the United States. And one of the first things he did was to reinstitute the income tax. Um, the biggest houses, of course, were then built before the income tax. Um, the rest of them were built before the income tax got too big, um, or soon around that time. It went up and down from the rest of that time through the rest of the 20th century. The income tax was always going, it was a football, it went up in times of stress and went down again when they wanted to improve business. So in the 20s, after a depression, after World War I, they, uh, the income tax went down in the mid-20s, and you had a period of low income tax in 1925, 26, 27, 28, 29, and people built like crazy in Lake Forest. Estates went up. Uh, maybe they didn't have as much staff as they'd had earlier, but the tax was low, um, the maximum income tax rate, I'm saying. Um, then it went up uh, to over 90% in 1933, uh, this had somewhat of a, you'd think it would have quite a, a chilling effect on the economy. Actually, because the stock market had crashed in 29, um, the dollar, you had tremendous deflation, and the dollar um, had gone down by a power of 10, really, and, and everything. So you, if you had 10 cents in 1930, 31, you could buy as much as you could buy for a dollar in 1929. So um, if you, even after the tax came in, it didn't really hurt people. <coughs> it wasn't until after World War II, for the most part, that they really got kicked um, as costs went up, inflation after the war, a lot of dollars chasing few goods. Some of us remember that. Um, and um, then the, all these people who come back from World War II had children. The children wanted to go to schools. They had no schools for them. They had to build them, so they raised property taxes. So mansions began to be torn down in the um, uh, 50, 40s and 50s, especially by the 50s. Mansions were being torn down or reduced, wings taken off so they wouldn't be taxed. Uh, 
uh, to reduce tax liability. Also, they began uh, subdividing off lots from houses around them um, and expecting people to build ranch houses, telling them to build ranch houses. Um, they had the effect of creating kind of a mother hen and baby chicks kind of situation. Um, and of course, nobody could really afford to build very much um, because the taxes were really high. Um, the, uh, the house at 965 East Deer Path um, was sold by the family for $30,000 on three and a half acres in 1955, I think, or something like that. Um, just to hope somebody would take it and keep it going. Um, people wanted little simple ranch houses, didn't want a big place. Um, so th things were changed quite a bit. Um, I came in the 70s to Lake Forest. Uh, the taxes had gone down in the early 60s, and there was quite a 60s building boom, sometimes on these lots, sometimes in farther in West Lake Forest, all the way out. Um, and so that was the that was beginning of change. But really, the, the real change came in the 80s when the income tax came down. And as we know, it's bounced around a little bit since. But since the 80s, the income tax has been significantly uh, lower than it was, let's say, in the middle half of the 20th century. Um, it's, it was, it's now considerably lower than it was then. And again, we have a building boom. Um, so what was special about the houses that were built early on? Uh, the houses that were built in the um, uh, 20s and the teens in that period, 1900s, they were part of what I would call the Chicago architectural renaissance. Um, it was an American renaissance of architecture. That's what one architect, uh, Peter B. White, referred to it when he described the house that the A.B. Dick family built, Westmoreland, um, west of 41. Uh, he called it an American Renaissance house, it, pulling on different elements. Um, so why was there a Renaissance? There were two, two big reasons why we had a Renaissance and why that would be a big thing in Chicago. What was the excitement about this building these new historically derived houses? Two things. One, all those New Englanders and all those uh, Scots had been um, very religious, and the center of their life had been their church. Um, they became more secular after the 1870s, and into the 80s. Um, there were more secular influences, like Lake Forest College got started, which was one here locally. But generally, where there had been a great kind of awakening period in the 1840s and things, there was kind of a liberalizing impact uh, through the rest of the century. And we've had these different waves of religious um, interest and uh, centeredness in uh, the 20th century and into the 21st century as well. Um, so we know what that means about these things going up and down. Um, this, so <coughs> the people were post-Puritan, a, gen a post-Puritan generation. Second big factor, right after the Civil War, you started to have, they discovered something new about railroad trains. Instead of stopping for lunch and at night to sleep on the train, you could actually do all those things on the train. Um, a fellow named Pullman from Chicago invented the sleeping car and then the uh, dining cars. And you could go from Chicago to New York and you wouldn't have to get off the train. And this was mind-boggling. Um, this was a real revolution um, because all of a sudden you had quick access to the East Coast. Maybe in a couple days at the worst, you know, you would be at in, in uh, New York City. When you got to New York City, they had something new also. They had steam liners going across the Atlantic Ocean and you could actually have a scheduled steamliner voyage to Europe. So at the same time that things were liberating, liberalizing for people with the center had always been the church in the 1870s, um, they could also take a vacation to Europe. Um, they, you'd have to have resources. You couldn't do it in a long weekend like we can do it. You can't go to four days to Paris uh, back then, but you could take four months and go to Paris or even four weeks and go to Paris. You might take a week going and a week coming back, and you'd be there for a week, or two weeks or 10 days. But uh, people were starting to do that. And when they went there, they found out that everything was not clabbered and white. Um, it wasn't um, small. It wasn't simple. Um, actually, things were quite elegant over there. And they also had just made a whole pot of money uh, with all the things they'd been doing on their railroad businesses, wholesaling. And so they came home and started to think, we'll build things that look like Europe. And so it was a true renaissance. They um, also started to send architects to France, to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, to study how to do it. And um, very soon, they were building magnificent places, totally on the scale, um, in, on the East Coast and here, 
of uh, places over there. Something that was unique in the Midwest about Lake Forest, that um, sort of obvious, we have a lake here, um, but for wealthy communities, we had a lake and we had living just west of us in uh, what is now Vermin Hills, but used to be um, West Lake Forest. You had uh, Samuel Insel living on Milwaukee Avenue, just across the Des Plaines River. Insel was the guy who invented central electric power plants and distributing power for lots of things. As soon as he discovered that, then he thought, I need customers. Um, so <laughs> he had these big plants, big fixed expenses to build them. He needed customers. So he started to think of things. One thing that you could do would be to um, pump water out of Lake Michigan with electric um, things to get the water out. And this kind of coincided with the growth of something new in Lake Forest, gardens. Um, we had huge, humongous gardens, 50, maybe more than that, gardens all over town that would employ 10 or 15 people, great greenhouses, that sort of thing. Um, the water would be pumped out. Every time there was a bump in the economy, people would build more gardens. And as soon as the economy tanked, they would notice that they didn't have enough water and they would have to flo float a bond issue to build more waterworks. Um, they would get letters, and some of the papers, Shirley Paddock has discovered some of the papers about how these waterworks um, happened, and they'd get letters, complaints that when Mrs. Van um, Diamond Fingers was watering her garden, um, Mr. Armour couldn't um, take a bath. It just wasn't possible. There wasn't enough water. So they were always leapfrogging ahead, building more water. And you notice it just happened again after 2000. We had big gardens going up in the 90s, and sure enough, what did we do with our waterworks? It expanded. Um, and we all have the water bills to prove it. Um, so these kind of rhythms of economic development. But gardens have always been something huge here. We created, actually, because of the water, we created in the Midwest a microclimate of the English garden. In England, you know, it's just, it rains every day for a little bit. Um, it's foggy, it's misty all through the summer. Um, in Lake Forest, it doesn't. It doesn't do much of anything from like mid-June until September. There's maybe not any rain and it's very dry and plants have to sort of survive. But they discovered that if they watered all the time, they could have a whole different climate. They could bring in plants from anywhere and grow them here. So the gardens were terrific. There was an, a kind of an anti-industrial response to that. Some of us know about Jens Jensen and the prairie style. He said, forget all that expensive hothouse plants and, and what, just stick with native plants, native forms. Don't make it look like Italy, because this is not Italy. Um, so you had these two different kind of approaches going on. And what was interesting is that the big estate people followed both approaches. They didn't say no to either one. They would hire gardens to be built closer to the house, and then they would hire Mr. Jensen, kind of probably shaking his head and upset, to do everything out beyond that, the big park out beyond with long views in different directions, or Warren Manning was another one who did them, or O.C. Simons. There were several of these gardeners who did the big parks, and there were lots of garden designers who did the gardens closer to the house. Um, we've revived several of these now recently, and recent years, and so there you can still see them around Lake Forest and on the Garden Conservancy open days. But um, that was, if, if we hadn't had Samuel Insel and Lake Michigan, there probably would have been nothing like that here that would be su such a, an important characteristic. The westernmost founding garden club of the Garden Club of America was the Lake Forest Garden Club in 1913. So they were huge already then. Um, so the development across here goes on like that. And what we have now is we've had all these different waves of economic change that have gone on in the 20th century into the 21st. We have also a movement coming along to um, preserve things. One of the big things that happened in the middle of the 20th century was modernism. Um, we had Hitler also, big political change. The big influence of Hitler was it led to Mies van der Rohe moving to Chicago. Mies van der Rohe built modern buildings and he, and he trained architects at IIT. And so then in the next generation, all the architects were trained at IIT and believed in modernism. And we had lots of modern houses all over in the 50s and 60s. Um, by the 70s, we were saying, wait a minute, there's old stuff from before that. Um, and so we had this usual rhythm that goes on with architecture, a dialectic between what your father's generation did and your grandfather's generation did. 
people leap back to what their grandfathers did. So today's Tribune shows, of course, Mies van der Rohe type style in, a, in the style article of an apartment that's been redone to look like a Mies van der Rohe apartment. And it's just like in a 1951 uh, glass houses that he built at 880 and 860 Lakeshore Drive. Um, so we're coming back to rediscovering some of that international style. Um, we had all these styles integrated to some extent in town, but by the 70s, preservationists came along to try to say, let's not lose that that's been buffeted around in the 20th century with all these changes. It was really some remarkable, never-before-seen kinds of architecture in America that happened then, and what do we do to preserve it? And that's what's some behind some of the, um, the, the, the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation's ideas. Um, it goes back to the actual people who were the early settlers here. They were influenced by these ideas of anti-modernism, <coughs> anti-urbanism, anti almost everything. Um, <laughs> but um, they, they, they had some leaders. And as I was at, I've been at the college library since the 70s, and as I would go in to clean out some of these big old houses, every house had a set of Ruskin, John Ruskin's writings, um, modern painters, uh, the Seven Lamps of Architecture, um, several of the sets. We actually gave sets to Chicago libraries because they didn't have them. And um, we just spread them around. What was in this Ruskin type of stuff? In his Seven Lamps of Architecture, he wrote one on the, the, the lamp of memory. And um, just to see what the people were thinking who, in Lake Forest, when they would tear down a building, they would move what was ever there before, and they would cobble it together with another one. Um, some people who maybe were here, like the Sterlings, Alice Moulton Ely, Bob, Alice and Bob Moulton Ely, they actually own houses like this where two other buildings were put together to make another house. Um, um, there are lots of stores that were uptown that were moved to lots of neighborhoods around town. I'm going to read one little quote from Ruskin to figure out what firebrands these people were. This is a short quote. <clears throat> There's again no question of expediency or feeling whether we shall preserve the buildings of past times or not. We, and this starts to be italicized, we have no right whatever to touch them, end of italics. They are not ours. They belong partly to those who built them and partly to all the generations of mankind who are to follow us. So, um, and then there's another quote, um, neither does the building uh, whatever belong to those um, mobs who do violence to it. For a mob it is, whether enraged or in deliberate folly, whether countless or sitting in committees, the people who destroy anything causelessly are a mob, and architecture is always destroyed causelessly. A fair building is necessarily worth the ground it stands upon and will be until Central Africa and America shall be, come as populous as Middlesex. Well, maybe we've gotten there. Um, nor is any cause whatever valid as a ground for its destruction. So this is the kind of thing, this is published in like 1849, um, published in England, spread all over um, America. So when the people were coming out here and building their houses, they were going back to this lamp of memory to build their Italian villas, their English cottages that they built. Um, and they would, whenever they would want to buy, they want to put a bigger house on a lot that had a smaller house, they would carefully move it to someplace else in town so that it would be there. So th what the actual preservation movement that started here 30 years ago actually goes back to the roots of these earlier kinds of people who were, were um, the people who settled the town who had some of these same things being drilled into them and literally just about every house in town did have some of these kinds of works in their places. Um, so why do we preserve things in Lake Forest? Um, they're very significant. Uh, didn't mention much about Market Square, but it was the first town center planned around motor vehicles. It was the first um, city beautiful development of a town center to not use um, public financing to undergird it with a city hall or a library or something, but to be all commercially driven. Um, it is the um, sort of what for Gothic architecture Saint-Denis outside of Paris is that Abbé Suger built, um, where the Gothic style gets started. 
where the mall gets started, 20, a major 20th century um, kind of characteristic. It starts in Lake Forest. And a guy wrote a book in 1997, um, Richard Longstreth, that really traces the history of malls and traces them back to Lake Forest that, th with our market square. So why, do we, why are we concerned about our buildings? Why are we concerned about why is Lake Forest special? It really is different than other communities, um, even along the North Shore. It's uh, remarkable in the Chicago area. It's um, one of the things that's best preserved so far, and we uh, are working hard to see that it's protected into the future. Its historic visual character is protected into the future. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, well Sheridan Road started out because of General Sheridan and wanting to be able to move troops up and down the North Shore when people were worried about, there was kind of a breakdown between the classes in the 1880s, the Haymarket riot, uh, and that was the reason for it originally. It also became a pleasure drive in time, um, and in a uniquely Lake Forest way, uh, and also in Lake Bluff, um, when people owned property and they wanted it to be different, they would change it. So for instance, on Lake Road, you know, Lake Road is kind of a straight street that goes along, except there's one kind of windy part. Actually, it's bumped out in one place because um, um, Byron Laughlin Smith, the founder of the Northern Trust Bank, owned all the property from the lake to Sheridan, and he wanted his house to have a little more space in front of it, so he just moved Lake Road out. Um, on Sheridan, Cyrus McCormick uh, owned Walden uh, down um, just really east of where Barra is and everything. That was where Walden was. And um, he actually had his landscape architect, with the permission of the city, which was happy to have him rebuild the road, uh, rebuilt Sheridan Road to where it is located now. Um, they had moved it north, uh, I'm sorry, west farther than it had been originally. It originally it kind of wandered up between the lake and the railroad tracks kind of halfway. But when uh, Cyrus McCormick's um, brother married a very wealthy eastern woman, Edith Rockefeller, um, and they bought all the land there that's now Villa Turicum, they moved Sheridan Road right smack dab up against the railroad tracks. Um, so he had to redo, re to link up with Sheridan Road again, he had to redo the whole road from Barra um, winding back toward where it goes along the ravines and things there. If you look in the culvert along there, um, where there go there's a ravine that goes by on Sheridan near where Walden is, down below there's beautiful stonework done by Warren Manning, um, who was um, Cyrus McCormick's landscape architect. It's still there. So he was the one who re redid the road. So Sheridan Road moved because of people making decisions about property. Did Sheridan Road once upon a time go through the tower at Fort Sheridan? Did Sheridan Road go through the tower? It may well have, because it kind of wandered along through the middle there somehow, but I'm not sure that that's true. But it, it, it certainly on the part that's Villa Turicum now, it was in the middle of Villa Turicum. Yes. There's a wonderful book at the library called The Merchants of Power, and it's all about Sam Insel and how he got. Yes. Have you read it? It's yeah. wonderful. It's by a local Arthur. Arthur, yeah. Uh, it's up saying, in I cannot pronounce Grays it. Lake or something, right? Yeah, yeah the Greenville. Yeah. But uh, in addition to the, the uh, power plant in Waukegan and the turbines that you mentioned. Oh, yeah. No, he, he did all kinds of things for Lake County. This was the first rural electrification was in Lake County. Um, other people got it in the 30s, but Lake County residents got it in the 1910s because Insel was trying to demonstrate what you could do with power. You know, you could pluck your chickens and milk your cows and do all kinds of things. I've worn you down? Okay. Thank you very much. Now, um, our chair is going to take over again, um, Liz Moore. Well, thank you so much, Art. That was really wonderful. Um, and I just wanted to go over um, a little bit more about our programming. Um, we've got some exciting programs coming up. Um, our first one um, on the postcard was listed as February 24th, which is the layout of Lake Forest. And we will be changing that date. And we'll get that information on our website. Um, April 6th, we are having a program on the train station. May 
will be our annual meeting we'll, where we will be announcing our awards. And June 8th, we will have a guest speaker of Craig Bergman, and we will be taking a tour of a garden. So that fits in very well on the garden today. So thank you very much. Uh,